Our final speaker is Rachel Ankeny, Associate Professor of History and Politics at the University of Adelaide and the primary investigator on the research connected with tonight's session, so it's all her fault. Her areas of expertise include bioethics, particularly relating to controversial biotechnological issues and policy making. And I happen to know she's also a very considerable gourmet and foodie. Please welcome Rachel. Thanks, Alan, and thanks to everyone for coming tonight because as uh, Jane said, you're sort of our research, you are our research subjects. And I want to thank the speakers as well, everyone for being willing to participate. Um, <clears throat> following up Allison is a little tricky because as you're going to see, a lot of, there's a lot of overlap between the legal and regulatory issues that Allison has just gone over and the sort of ethical issues that are typically raised. But what I want you to do is, is in a sense, flip your thinking around. Allison was talking about how we should set up laws, regulations, systems of governance to control or not control, allow synthetic biology to flourish. What I am going to talk about then instead is what should be done, and even some more fundamental questions about the nature of synthetic biology research and if it's the sort of thing we think um, should be permitted, should be promoted, and under what conditions. So there's clear overlap between regulation and um, ethics, um, but in some way the ethics issues perhaps are even uh, more fundamental. Which regulatory system you want is probably in a sense a function of, of your ethical viewpoint on these issues. So what are the main ethical issues people usually raise? <clears throat> a lot of them, by the way, I want to say, and this goes to something that all the speakers have mentioned, overlap with the sorts of concerns people often raise about genetic modification. So synthetic biology, um, in many of its forms, is a form of genetic modification. Um, and if you've heard the debates that surround genetic modification of crops or genetic modification in general, you'll notice that some of the issues that I'm going to raise here are very much uh, very similar to the ones that are raised in that domain. The first one, and I'll just run these through and then I'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, the first one people often raise is what's often referred to as the playing God concern or the tampering with nature. And those words are supposed to be pejorative, obviously. Um, the second is, is that um, reductionism as a scientific strategy is misplaced or misguided and therefore is something we shouldn't encourage. The third, Allison's touched on, but I want to try and draw out the ethical side of it, is the dual use dilemma and the biosecurity concerns that, that carry with it. Fourth, should results be made public? And that's related both to the biosecurity concerns but also questions about what you think the nature of science is and should be. Relatedly, who should have control over and access to the technologies that are created using the techniques associated with synthetic biology. And finally, we might even be able to summarize all of these kinds of things and the ethical concerns more generally under the rubric of how do we weigh up the risks, the potential risks, the real risks, the unknown risks against the potential and real, realized in some of the instances that were discussed earlier, benefits. And that's a very typical kind of weighing process we go through when we think about ethical issues. So first, what are people worried about when they make claims similar to the following, that scientists are playing God? Or if you don't believe in God or you have different religious beliefs or you don't have religious beliefs at all, there's something fundamentally wrong with tampering with nature. As Claudia and Desmond have talked about, a lot of what goes on in synthetic biology in a way combines um, our knowledge and our understandings of um, particularly DNA processes with natural entities out there in the world. And so it harnesses a lot of those processes that occur naturally in the DNA and otherwise um, and uses them then to create something that is synthetic. It's new. It's artificial. It may be a hybrid of, of you know, <laughs> the cell that's containing it obviously might be as well natural, but the end product is something you're never going to see in nature. That's a fundamental difference, say, to um, genetic modification of crops where um, some people would argue many of the things you see are actually just... Um, speedy versions of what might occur if you allowed plants to hybridize naturally. Many of them aren't that, but some of them are that, perhaps. So in this domain, what people are concerned about is that in some sense, there's a core idea of what's natural. No matter how you think it might have been created, created by a god, um, created through evolution, um, somehow else, um, people think that there's something that's natural and that it's problematic if you start to disturb and meddle with that. 
and that to start to tinker in this domain is a dangerous thing because we don't fully understand how these processes work. Uh, perhaps our knowledge has grown rapidly and the history that was recounted earlier is very accurate. Um, nonetheless, we are not in full possession of all the information we would need. And hence, there's something fundamental about what is natural that we shouldn't be, or scientists shouldn't be, tinkering with. Now, many people obviously disagree and would say, science aims to come to these fundamental understandings, and one of the only ways to do this is to, in fact, tinker, to alter, to modify, and see what then happens. Um, and furthermore, that's, in a sense, what happens with all forms of technology. Um, if you're going to create anything useful, you have to figure out how what you already have works, maybe that is a product of nature, um, and then harness it, make it useful. And this isn't fundamentally different in some way than lots of other areas of science that seek both to come to an understanding of processes that are out there in the natural world, but also in some way harness, control, redirect them. It just happens that it's a more fundamental, perhaps, um, unit that you're working on, namely at the organismal level, and that you're actually producing what is uh, a product that looks an awful lot like a natural product, but happens to be synthetic. That's the only difference. But the people who would disagree with the playing God or the meddling nature objection would say, that isn't a fundamental difference that should change the way we think about this. This is still a useful technology. So those are sort of the two sides about that. Um, a further kind of wrinkle is that many people would say, um, even if you do believe in God, God created human beings, some of whom are um, clever and become scientists, and who you know, are, have been imbued with this um, ability to try and figure out the natural world. Even more generally, as humans, we're interested in the natural world, and perhaps God or something created those sort of, um, uh, that sort of sense of curiosity. So those are the two sides of that one. The reductionistic kind of objection um, is probably a more global objection coming from the point of view of people who have um, issues more generally with what science is trying to do. And people who make this objection would be thinking that there's a problem more generally with the direction of science trying to always reduce something down to, say, a minimal genome of the sort that Craig Venter made. Um, and that uh, we should be focused more on higher level properties. Um, and not always just on DNA as building blocks, and that that's been a misguided strategy. Now, that's slightly an ethical objection. It's slightly uh, what you think sh science should do and what strategy science should take. Um, people think further that this could result in a minimization of what's unique, for example, about human beings or about natural organisms. If we can just create artificial ones, there isn't something in very special about what already exists. Again, people who would object to this would say, this is actually a strategy for understanding what's so special about living life forms versus non-organic and other non-living life forms. And looking into these kinds of issues is a crucial way for us to come to value them and to appreciate what nature can do for us. Two sides, as usual. The dual use dilemma Allison's outlined quite nicely, and it has to do with this idea that uh, moral dilemmas are associated with science that can be used for bad purposes. But in particular, people use the term when it's a type of science where we can foresee it could go one direction or the other. And not all types of science have such an obvious uh, connection to potential malevolent uses or, or evil or bad uses. Synthetic biology in particular has been a bit of a battering boy for this kind of concern because many of the bugs, as Allison called it, or the organisms um, that we can use um, and are being used to create antimalarial drugs um, also can be harnessed potentially for ill purposes. Um, they could be re-engineered. And so you may know, for example, that samples of smallpox have largely been destroyed in part because there's fears that they could fall into the wrong hands and smallpox could be recreated and this sort of thing, right? Similar kinds of things going on here that people could use the very same techniques using many of the same materials that are used for these good purposes and create these organisms and therefore commit acts of bioterrorism and so on. If you can just order things off the web, you can see how this becomes a more pressing type of concern. Um, consequently, many people see this as a fundamental ethical objection to allowing the research to go on at all. Once the knowledge is out there, other people will be able to get hold of it. Um, many people then would say in response, well, the point is to minimize this. It isn't to stop all research in the name of these fears, which are very real, um, but to think about regulatory mechanisms. And for that, over to Allison's discussion. A fourth sort of ethical issue often raised is should results be made public? It, it intersects, as I said, with the biosecurity concern. People have said because of the dual use dilemma and the potential risks, we should in fact actively censor research in this domain. 
and not allow people to publish, for example, their results, their techniques, or hold back enough that nobody could repeat the, the work. This runs counter to the usual ethos in science, which says, in fact, we want to be able to replicate the work. We want to be able to draw on um, others' results as scientists um, and be able to learn from mistakes, learn from the processes and the technologies that are being developed. This is a pretty fundamental debate which runs deep within the synthetic biology community, but certainly in the regulatory and biodefense kinds of communities. Um, <clears throat> the problem probably is, is that not only an ethical issue about we could change the nature of science by censoring, but more fundamentally that there are practical problems. I mean, you can control knowledge to a certain extent, but it'll probably always get out there. And so is it worth changing the public nature of science, the, the, the ethos of science as something that's a shared enterprise, um, in hopes of a, a vague proposal that uh, knowledge won't fall into the wrong hands. Critics say it's not the right strategy. Access control and patenting is the fifth issue I wanted to raise. Again, Allison has mentioned this. Think about it from an ethical point of view. We have commercial products that may or may not be accessible to a wide audience. So even though those costs are going greatly down, and perhaps antimalarials now are going to be available much, much more widely, they are available much more widely, we still have concerns that in some instances we may have commercial companies going off, making products, sometimes using pub a mixture of public and private dollars, and the products may not be available to everyone. Think about some of the debates you've surely heard um, over very expensive medications. Um, we know one of the primary um, outcomes of many of the projects within synthetic biology will be novel um, medications that will work in more efficient, more tailored ways, and so on. And yet, if those are produced primarily commercially, will we, the public, ever see the benefits? And given that these are natural entities to begin with, much like genes were or other natural things, people think perhaps this is different than other areas where commercialization might be more fair game. There is a concern that we should place more limits in this domain because um, everyone, in a sense, uh, has stewardship of the natural world. And so that it is fundamentally different than other commercial or capitalistic enterprises. Some, again, would say these are technologies like anything else. People are investing effort, knowledge, and resources. They should be able to benefit in some way, to a fair extent, from those efforts. And therefore, a fair patenting system would be sufficient. Um, it also takes it in the domain of can we trust scientists to self-regulate, where they have a great deal at stake of personal interest. Even if it's not cash, it may well be prestige. It may be being able to research, becoming a professor at Harvard. Um, whatever it is, they're invested. And therefore, we can't fully trust them to self-regulate. And that's one of the questions we want you to consider tonight, whether something like a self-regulatory system is sufficient or whether we really do need some form of public or government oversight. So in summary, do the potential harms outweigh the potential benefits? We've heard a lot tonight about some fantastic potential benefits and real benefits accruing from those who are doing research in synthetic biology. Your view on whether pursuing different lines of research within synthetic biology um, should be allowed and under what conditions is clearly going to be a function of whether you think the benefits outweigh the potential harms. In summary, the potential harms are there could be real harms to human health and especially people who are working um, with these modified organisms. There may be regulatory schemes we can put in place for controlled trials where they're not released into the field or into the environment, much like genetic modification in general. But in the long run, of course, the point is to make products that are going to be out there in the world. Are there harms because these could get out of control in some way? We don't fully know what all the properties are that these organisms could, or these modified entities could um, exhibit over time. Is that too grave a risk? to allow certain sorts of things to go out, particularly where the benefits may be lower than other domains. Further, there are questions, and people put it in these terms, which I don't like, but it's a, sh a nice shorthand. We know about potential harms. We can make some guesses about potential harms, like the dual use issues. But what about the things we can't guess at yet? One of the joys of nature is that it creates novel things. But if that's the case, if we're creating new organisms, scientists are creating novel organisms, could they have different outcomes than we anticipate? And if so, how do we measure, how do we assess those before we release these things into the open, into uh, the environment? And finally, a horrible term with the American X and especially unknown unknowns, um, things we can't even guess at, right? Um, it harms that can't even be anticipated by the most intelligent, clever scientists who are versed in this domain. Benefits, obviously, very strong arguments, although you might want to think about, and this is the last point I want to make, um, 
are we willing to take higher risks for something like an anti-malarial drug that's going to help the developing world versus something that might be a more cosmetic product or that's going to potentially make life just a little bit easier in a very uh, affluent, uh, developed world? What are the trade-offs and what are the risks we're willing to take? Thank you.